Ukraine is a mess. Don't blame Donald Trump for that. Well, you know, one minute. Okay. Ja, wir brauchen die NATO. Wir sind everywhere, from Lithuania to the Sahel, to Afghanistan, to Iraq, to Lebanon. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Welcome back to War and Peace. I'm your host, Olga Olaker. And I'm your co-host, Hugh Pope. And in the studio with us today is Claudia Gazzini. Claudia is the International Crisis Group Senior Analyst for Libya, a country where she has been working for quite some time. And we are going to talk about the evolution of events there. I actually thought we'd start with some history. Not too much history, but maybe a little bit of history. 2011, Gaddafi falls, he's killed, and it's been war ever since. Who's fighting? First of all, hello. Uh, <laughs> yes, hello. It's nice, it's nice to be with you, with you both here today. I've been following Libya since 2011, and I've known the country actually from before. Sadly, as you say, the war in Libya has had different evolutions, but has substantially never stopped since 2011. When NATO decided to intervene to topple the Gaddafi regime, the war was between the regime and rebel forces that were supported by NATO at the time. Since then, it has morphed into uh, different local conflicts. It became gradually, by 2014, uh, a war between pro-Islamists and uh, anti-Islamists. And Perhaps this is a binary characterization that sort of oversimplifies the reality. But essentially, it became a war between those who believe that the transformation of Libya or the political evolution of Libya should happen by politics alone. So through elections and elected uh, officials, that was what the Tripoli-based sort of pro-Islamist coalition believed in. And in the East, where there was another idea that was emerging, which is, Politics alone will not be enough to stabilize a country, but military needs to stabilize a country. So the project became supporting a strong military as a way to support a stable Libya. And this is what we're seeing today. We're seeing a war essentially between these two lines of thought. Now there's a war in Tripoli, in the outskirts of Tripoli, between the Tripoli-based government, which is a government that has within it the support of some Islamist factions and has the support of local armed groups. And it's under siege by the forces led by Khalifa Haftar, a military commander based in eastern Libya, who has set up, with the help of Emirati and Egyptian and Russian uh, support, a military coalition that is not recognized internationally, but receives support by some states, and essentially is attacking Tripoli because it believes that the Tripoli-based government, despite being the international recognized one, is unable to stabilize a country because it does not have a military structure that can control the country, doesn't have monopoly of force, and he wants to throw it out and replace it with another government. And NATO, having played such a key role in the overthrow of Gaddafi, NATO members are not all on the same side, much less the same page in this conflict now. No, in 2011, it was easy to all side with what appeared to be the good guys, mm -hmm. right? Gaddafi was a bad guy, the rebel forces trying to bring down this dictator were, were the good guys. But black and white now does not apply so well in Libya. And we have NATO countries that indeed support different sides of the war. Officially, everybody recognizes the Tripoli-based government as legitimate. But some countries are supporting the Haftar-based military, namely France which has been engaging in counterterrorism operations alongside Haftar mm -hmm. forces since 2014. But this counterterrorism support gradually evolved into sort of more broader military support and political support. I mean, what do we even mean when we say counterterrorism in this context? Well, remember that in 2014, Eastern Libya, you might remember that U.S. ambassador to Libya it was mm -hmm. attacked in Benghazi. The consulate there was attacked. It was a shocking moment. It was September 2012. I remember it very well because I was in Tripoli and my crisis group delegation arrived the day of the killing of oh. the U.S. ambassador. So it was very impactful even on us uh, as an organization. But remember this killing of this U.S. ambassador in Benghazi. At the time, we didn't really know well what happened, but 
eventually it sort of emerged that, yes, he was killed by an attack led by some Islamist factions on the ground in Benghazi. So that epitomized the moment in which Benghazi became increasingly a site where Islamist groups, various groups, we had Takfiris, we had Al-Qaeda line groups, budding, you know, Islamic State groups, uh, gradually started to control the city. So we had in one year, in 2013, 2014, up to 500 assassinations of military officials. So counterterrorism in 2014 meant this, meant helping the local forces, Haftar forces, to counter what they perceived as an increasing control by Islamist factions, militarized Islamist factions of Benghazi. Claudio, you're one of the very few people who regularly goes to the eastern Benghazi, and you've described quite a frightening scenario there five years ago. What's it like now? The reality has changed drastically since then, and I've been going regularly, as you say, since 2012, a few times a year. I remember in 2012, you know, we had a market, open air market, where guns were being sold in Key Square. Did you buy one? Uh, no, but I was <laughs> offered one. <laughs> was it price? Not the price? Yeah, it was cheap. It was like 500 bucks. And then, you know, uh, 2014, 2015, we had an actual war in the streets of Benghazi. Most of the city was off limits because you had um, uh, militants from an, a group called Ansar Sharia, which is an Al Qaeda um, uh, sort of linked uh, uh, group. Uh, we started to see the formation of um, Islamic State's uh, forces that allied with uh, Ansar Sharia. So Benghazi, you know, until late 2015, 2016, was off limits for most of its residents. Fast forward to today, and the reality is very different. It's a city that now has been cleansed of Islamist groups and forces. Life is back to normal, and it's actually booming economically because residents and local institutions have managed to tap into various funds to improve the economic uh, outlook of the area. The city is very much destroyed. This three-year war has destroyed buildings, universities, roads, sewage. The sewage system is destroyed. But slowly you're starting to see change. Roads are being repaired electricity so, is coming up. and Who is paying for that? It's a complicated issue in the sense that Eastern Libya depends financially in terms of public sector employees and so salaries on Tripoli. So here we are in a country mm-hmm. where two sides are at war with one another, but one side is still paying salaries to the other. And it is rather absurd. But this, this system has been in place uh, forever because Libya depends on oil revenues and oil revenues accrue to the Tripoli-based uh, government. But most of these infrastructural projects are funded by the parallel government in the east that is a Mm non-recognized government that does not have access to oil resources and the way the parallel government funds itself is through treasury bills if you want which the eastern based government considers legitimate but the international community and the Tripoli based authorities considered practically a financial scam because Mm -hmm. they don't consider these bonds to be legitimate. There's also money from the outside coming in. We know of Saudi and Gulf financial support to authorities in the East. How does this compare with the situation in Tripoli then? Tripoli has been under siege now for 10 months. Uh, There is a war in the outskirts of Tripoli that for, you know, eight months has seen Aerial bombardments every day, drone strikes, not only on airports of Misrata and Tripoli, but on residential areas, because essentially this fighting set in in residential areas. If you go to Tripoli uh, now, and I was there only last week, you can see that the periphery of the city is completely closed off to fighting. So actually the borders of the city are only sort of 10 kilometers from the city center. That that's where the fighting is. But life goes on. People in, in the city center hear the bombing in the background, but also go on with their lives. Uh, there's, <laughs> there's a certain level of wealth, which is uh, you know always surprising in Libya, that goes around. You see very fancy chocolate shops popping up mm-hmm. and, uh, <laughs> and the hairdressers and weddings and all of that. That continues. But ordinary people are hit by and affected by electricity shortages, which continue for hours and hours every day, gas shortages, very simple things. You know, Libyans use gas tanks for their cooking, mm-hmm. uh, cooking, cooking gas. And uh, normally these are subsidized by the state. It would cost, let's say, 
two dinars, which is less than a dollar, uh, to fill up one of these gas cooking tanks, you can't find them anymore. And you can only find them at the black market, and it would cost about $50 to fill up a, a gas tank. Like in cooking a normal gas. country. Uh, like in a normal country. Uh, and so services are being affected. People die every day. I meet Libyan friends that tell me that in their little road, in their little neighborhood, four young men were, were killed uh, because of the fighting, because essentially the war in Tripoli has persuaded a lot of even high school boys to join the fight without necessarily having military training, but in the name of defending Tripoli from what they perceive as a future dictatorial regime by half if he were to conquer Tripoli. So there's a lot of idealism in, mm. in Tripoli amongst those that join the fight and say that they have to join because otherwise Libya will return to a one-man uh, rule. And it's it's quite unfortunate that the narrative about Libya's future has sort of been reduced to choosing between a one-man rule <laughs> or an inefficient, formally democratic or power-sharing government, but that is unable to really manage uh, the state. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. You're listening to War and Peace, and we are talking to Claudia Gazzini about Libya. Speaking of inefficient democracies, uh, what's the EU role in all of this? <laughs> <laughs> it seems to be helping and hindering at the same time, doesn't it? Yes. I mean, the EU's obsession with Libya, of course, over the past years has been primarily about keeping migrants at bay in Libya. Uh, Libya is, for the EU, mainly the transit point of uh, sub-Saharan Africans uh, wanting to reach Europe because of the chaos in the country. It was, be- it was very easy for them to enter Libya through the southern borders, find their way to the north, to the coast, and from there find their way across the Mediterranean on makeshift boats, dinghies, uh, and so on. In one year, in 2015, we had over uh, 100,000 migrants reaching Europe. So for Europe, uh, Libya became an issue of domestic politics, how to stop migrants, in Italy especially. It has therefore sought to reach agreements with the Tripoli-based authorities in order to ensure that migrants saved at sea be returned to Libya. And this, of course, has led to a major sort of soul-searching debate within Mm -hmm. Europe on whether this was humane, was it was humane to support a policy that led migrants to be returned back to Libya, knowing that the conditions in these detention centers, because when migrants are returned to Libya, they go to detention centers where they are abused and in some case trafficked, or whether Europe... Uh, morally would be more morally correct for Europe to actually accept these migrants and help them in uh, integrate in Europe. So the debate about migration has really been the focus in Europe at the expense of the conflict. Or rather, one can say perhaps that focusing on migration solely has allowed European powers to avoid the question of what to do with with Libya as a failed state, as a conflict country. Because uh, realistically, the the question is, does Europe or do member states step in in Libya and try to support more the internationally recognized government as the internationally recognized government in Tripoli has always been demanding? Or does Europe actually take sides in supporting, as Paris did, let's say this rival entity and authority based in eastern Libya. In a certain sense, Europe has avoided the problem, has avoided taking sides, and it continues to avoid to take sides. This last year, avoiding to take sides had very much to do with the U.S. repositioning Mm -hmm. on on Libya, because, you know, Europe traditionally, Mediterranean issues has a tendency to follow where Washington stands. Despite the challenges inherent in that, that seem to be growing with each passing year. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. But, you know, when, when we're talking about country at war and we're potentially deciding where you stand in a country at war means that you're actively engaging and actively supporting the idea of, you know, supporting a side that may be your big ally, the Washington is, mm-hmm. not, is not supporting, it becomes problematic. So Washington has traditionally, I mean, over the past years, always supported the Tripoli based government, it supported this power sharing deal that brought to power this government in, in 2016. But early on, uh, in 2019, in, in April, Washington seemed to have taken a different position. And suddenly, um, President Trump uh, gave the green light to Haftar to support 
say, his cause and support the offensive against Tripoli, not directly, but in, indirectly, meaning that the U.S. was not going to stop him and was not going to support a U.N. Security Council resolution calling for a, a stop in the hostilities. So this meant that for the past year, Washington has actually sided with Haftar and embraced what the Egyptian president had asked President Trump, the two have good ties, embrace this sort of pro Haftar line. For Europe, that means not being able to actually actively support the GNA in Tripoli because it would have meant going against what are the strategic lines of US foreign policy on Libya. And then enter a surprise actor, Turkey came with the cavalry coming over the hill or the however you want to put it, suddenly arrived on the equation to everyone's apparent surprise. And I, I think you've recently been in Ankara talking to Turkish officials. Can you explain what must seem to a lot of people a slightly disconnect Turkey, Libya? Where does it come from? Yes. Well, Turkey has been overtly supporting Tripoli-based authorities and the whole anti haftar arm groups for years now, I dare say, since 2014 or 2015. But what changed uh, in recent months is that Turkey decided to transform what was a covert support into an overt Mm -hmm. support, Uh, meaning that Turkey has actually signed and publicized agreements with the Tripoli-based authorities. It has brought the debate about supporting militarily the Tripoli-based authorities to parliament and Ankara. Therefore, the government in Ankara clinched a parliamentary approval to intervention or Mm -hmm. to military, to supporting militarily the Tripoli-based authorities. Now, this has to do with a number of things. They are. They are supporting them militarily. They they are. They are. So what changed is that before they were providing drones and and armed personnel carriers covertly, even though leaks were occurring and we knew of them. Now they're doing that in the open. They're doing that based on an agreement that they have with the Tripoli-based authorities. Mind you, all of this is still in violation of the UN arms embargo, right? But, you know, Turkish authorities like to say that their support to Tripoli is legitimate because Tripoli is a legitimate un back internationally recognized uh, government. But they avoid the question of... Uh, of <laughs> They avoid focusing on the fact that regardless of whether Tripoli is legitimate or not, this is a violation of the UN arms embargo. But they have so far provided uh, several dozen Turkish army officers as sort of strategic planners, war planners. They have provided weapons and aerial defenses that have been set up in Tripoli and Misrata. And allegedly, they are facilitating also the transfer of Syrian rebel forces. These are Syrian pro-Turkish rebel forces to Tripoli to help in fight on the front lines. Because there's not enough going on in Syria to occupy these people. <laughs> uh, exactly. No, literally. I mean, it might seem like a joke, but there is a, there is an abundance of uh, of labor force in uh, in Syria. A lot of people on the Turkish payroll to start with, and uh, the need to keep them occupied. And most importantly, I think a reality in Libya from Turkish perspective that required some extra extra manpower. So from the Turkish point of view, the reason why they wanted to up their intervention in, in Libya is uh, multi-layered. First, from, from a strictly Libyan point of view, the reality on the ground, the Turkish officials say, uh, warranted. Since November, we've seen Haftar forces encroaching increasingly on the cap- in, in the center of the capital, and therefore there was a need to stop Tripoli from falling. This would have been a nightmare scenario for Turkey, seeing a pro Haftar, which means pro Egypt, mm-hmm. pro Emirati government coming to power in Tripoli. It would have meant that, from Turkish perspective, that this uh, Egyptian Emirati axis would have started to expand across North Africa, and that's something they wanted to avoid. But also, from a Turkish point of view, there are other reasons for wanting to keep this strictly based government in in, uh, in power. One is defending a recently signed memorandum of understanding that draws new boundaries in the Mediterranean waters between Turkey and uh, and Libya. This is something that is part of the Turkish sort of strategic priorities. The idea that the map of the Mediterranean needs to be redrawn in order to defend and Turkey's what they called 
the blue nation, the seas, the, <laughs> the seas where, <laughs> where nationalism is not only about territory, but also control over the seas. So Turkey f- sees itself as increasingly imprisoned by an axis of countries that goes through Greece, Egypt, Cyprus and Israel that claim too much of the Mediterranean, according to Turkish officials. So this is also a very important factor. And more broadly, it's this geopolitical competition that is occurring around the Mediterranean that Turkey wants to insert itself into since the failure of the Arab Spring to bring Mm -hmm. about pro-Turkish Turkish countries and increasingly the rise of countries that are actually hostile to Ankara. I think there is a new trajectory in Turkish foreign policy whereby Turkey needs to go out of its sphere of comfort in in order to take part in that geopolitical competition in order to avoid that country such as Egypt and the Emirates encircle it. So another country that often has a narrative of supporting the sovereign legal government, but in this case is arguably not, would be Russia. You know, it gets along with Turkey on so many things, but in almost all the wars, they're on opposite sides and Mm -hmm. here as well. Can you talk a little bit about what the Russian role is and what the limits of the Russian role are? Mm -hmm. Russia is one of the countries that is supporting General Haftar practically, first by providing weapons, Russian-produced weapons, to Haftar forces. Russia claims that this is legitimate and the basis of contracts inherited from the Gaddafi era. Era. And so they're just fulfilling <laughs> these, uh, these contract requirements. And, and on the basis of that, they have for years now been providing Russian-made equipment to Haftar. Also because in the Gaddafi era, the, most of the planes were Russian-made. So mm-hmm. We're talking about MiGs. And so this is a continuation, let's say, of Russian's weapons delivery from, from the Gaddafi era. So this is one. The second way Russia is supporting Haftar forces is financially. Now, you might say... How is that possible? You know, Russia is broke in and of itself. So how can financial... Russia's uh, not quite broke, but it's not that big on the foreign aid. It's it's Mm -hmm. not that well endowed as to be able to Mm -hmm. actually spend money on Libya. And actually, it's not spending any, uh, not even a cent on Libya. What Russia does is to print Libyan currency in Russia and delivers what is now believed to be several billion Libyan dinars, so several, the equivalent of several billion dollars worth of Libyan currency to the authorities in the East. So it injects cash into the East-based banking system. It seems a little system. inflationary. Uh, yes, it is, but it actually hasn't hasn't triggered inflation because the East was in short in cash because cash was delivered to Western mm-hmm. banks, but not so much to the East. So the East justifies this by saying that they're actually compensating for what they're not receiving from the authorities. But anyway, this cash has allowed the East to bankroll itself and keep it alive, uh-huh. actually. And the third way Russia is supporting um, Eastern authorities is by putting on the ground Russian fighters. So we believe that these are private military contractors that have the blessing of the Kremlin to operate in Libya, but they have been boots on the ground, let's mm-hmm. say, fighting alongside Haftar over you know the past few months, surely between September and November 2019. Mm-hmm. I think there are different motives for why Russia does this, and it's, it's not so clear-cut. It's not just about supporting Haftar. It's sort of supporting the idea of a return of the old regime yeah. and getting back to the Americans for what they still perceive as this uh, 2011 push for a regime change that that Russians have never accepted. And from a Russian perspective, created all this chaos, right? Yes. Yeah. I'm afraid we're out of time, but I think this has been a really fascinating conversation. I learned a lot. Thank you so much, Claudia, for joining us. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Thank you, Claudia. And if anyone wants to follow more of Claudia's work, you just go to our website and click on Libya and you'll see it all there, crisisgroup.org. War and Peace is a podcast of the Europod Podcast Network. We are very grateful to Miranda Sonnex, who makes sure that Hugh and I show up at these things, at least moderately prepared. We are always grateful to you, our listeners, for tuning in. Thank you, and see you in two weeks. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group.